So kia ora everybody, good morning. The theme of this year's TED Talks at the University of Auckland is Chasing Horizons. I believe we can agree that we've all made amazing progress in sectors such as science, technology, culture, and art. But with this level of progress also brings a level of anxiety that we've never experienced before. We're anxious about where this is all going. We're anxious about whether technologies will take over. And ironically, above all, we're anxious about how to keep up with the rate of progress. On a consumer level, we're disappointed when the newest gadgets don't quite live up to our expectations. And on the global level, we rely on this continued level of progress in order to tackle many of the pressing challenges we're facing. So this, this is one of the hottest topics we're discussing today. And one of the ideas being put forward by people is that in order to keep up this progress, we must start working across disciplines. So in essence, we need to start working in an interdisciplinary manner. And that is going to be the topic of my talk today, with a focus or emphasis on biomedical engineering and healthcare. Right, so let me give you an example of technology, right? And it sits right here in my pocket, and perhaps in yours as well, which is one of these contraptions, a phone. Many of us can't even live in Imagine living without it, we are obligated to check it every five minutes to make sure we are still connected to the rest of the world. So my question to you this morning is, do we have an idea how many engineers it took to make this phone? Well, the answer is I actually don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but what I did find out is that over 800 engineers worked on the camera of this phone, which I'm holding upside down. And there are over 200 components in the camera system of this phone. Amazing, right? Simply amazing. Now, what do most of us do with this amazing piece of tech? Well, of course, we take selfies with it, sometimes in wildly inappropriate places. And in fact, one in three photos we take are selfies. Now, the reason I'm talking about the phone is because it's been touted as one of the very good examples where we're using these technologies every day without realizing how complex it is. Which nicely segues into the actual quote-unquote device that I actually want to talk to you about today. Imagine there's a device, quote-unquote device, that has over 37 trillion parts in it. And in New Zealand, this device has an operating lifespan, on average, of 85 years. And yes, some of you might have already guessed it when I said device. I, of course, mean us, human beings. There are, on average, 37 trillion cells in the human body. Amazingly complex. And certainly doesn't take hundreds of people to create. Usually, it only takes two people to create one of us. <laughs> And while this is not the kind of talk um, that discuss that in detail, despite what's being advertised, this is the kind of talk to highlight the complexity of the human body and the amount of effort it takes to understand it. There are literally millions of scientists all over the world working every day to uncover the human body, to study diseases, and to find cures to these diseases. To just give you an idea of the amount of effort it takes, it took two labs of world-leading scientists in Japan and the US to understand the role of your immune cells in fighting against cancer. So they discovered how to make immune cells which are inside your body to stop the spread of cancer. This essentially offers us a potential cure for cancer, and that's fantastic, isn't it? By the way, that's not my opinion. It is the opinion of the Nobel Prize Committee last year. This was award awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Well, being a nerd that I am, I, 
I, I looked up their publications and very quickly realized that this dis discovery took well over 20 years to make. So the obvious question we have to ask ourselves today is, can we do something about speeding up this rate of innovation so we can make more discoveries like this more quickly, right? That's always nice. And when we get asked a question like that, one of the things we can do is to examine the system, identifying the factors that are slowing us down. And in my opinion, one of the factors that is slowing down or impeding the rate of innovation today is the silo effect. Well, the silo effect is when scientists are becoming not just specialized, they're becoming super specialized in their subject area. The techniques and the technical language they work on are only really understood by a few of their immediate peers. So in essence, they organize themselves into these intellectual and sometimes even figurative silos. The problem, as you can imagine, other than the isolation of it all, in my opinion, the biggest challenge here to innovation is that the silos impede reproducibility, which is one of the crucial fundamental aspects of modern scientific research. Now, reproducibility works like this. Now, when scientist A discovers something new, she will write up this finding in a journal along with the method or the recipe by which she uh, followed to make these observations. Once this is peer reviewed and published, scientists B and C could ideally follow this recipe just like a cooking show and reproduce the findings that scientist A has made in the process reproducing or validating the methods and the observations of scientist A, but crucially for innovation, the technique developed by scientist A is now copied. So scientist B and C could go on and make their own improvements. You can imagine that the rate of innovation in this case is basically geometric. But what happens when the technique described by scientist A is only really understood by herself or her own immediate peers in her own lab. Well, as you can imagine, that the rate of progress in this case will depend on the productivity of a single lab or single individual, which is also often a very dangerous thing. In fact, reproducibility is becoming such a problem that in a survey conducted by Nature, one of the top international journals um, a couple years ago, over 70% of the scientists admitted that they couldn't reproduce their peers' work. And if you think that's bad, over half of them admitted that they couldn't reproduce their own earlier work. So that's clearly a problem. So how do we go about overcoming this silo effect? Well, many people have advocated that we're simply smashing down the barriers established by the traditional subject areas. And so people can all come together and work together. That's nice. However, that concept, in my opinion, ignores the reason why these silos are there in the first place. As you can see, education and trainings these days take so long and techniques are so complex that people naturally organize themselves into intellectual silos. So they're there for a reason. So perhaps instead of smashing down these silos completely, we should instead be aiming passageways or bridges at higher levels across these silos. So scientists or researchers in one silo, when they get bored, can walk across the bridge, visit the researchers in the other silo, have a cup of coffee, discuss the problems they encounter at work, and the people in the other silo might go, aha, but I have a solution to your problem. And that is how interdisciplinary research or work happen. And if you think that's a really high-minded idea, I'm actually very glad to, to say that that is, already, that is something that is already happening right here at the University of Auckland, especially with the student body. 
case in point, this event, for example. But also the velocity challenge, which is a business competition organized here at this university. I see students every year forming teams of students from different disciplines, putting forward innovative technological solutions to address healthcare needs. And some of them are even able to see something directly from concept all the way to the final commercialization point. There are also new emerging disciplines that are interdisciplinary in nature, such as biomedical engineering, where engineers apply traditional engineering techniques to study the human body, develop tools for the treatment and diagnosis of diseases. Now, I did biomedical engineering myself right here at the University of Auckland, and my subject area involves studying the gastrointestinal tract, or the guts. So I like to tell people that we're the research group with guts. <laughs> <laughs> the gut is basically a highly muscular tract throughout your body. If you look inside, I'm sorry for showing this to you so early in the morning, there are a series of contractions going on. And these contractions basically help to break down the food we eat and facilitate a healthy digestion. I, in particular, study the bioelectrical event that govern these contractions. But perhaps relevant to the topic today is I also work with an interdisciplinary team and a startup company that is trying to make a tool to aid the diagnostic process of many gut conditions. In this team, as you can imagine, we obviously have engineers and clinicians. But perhaps what might surprise you is we also have a regulatory manager who makes sure that every data we gather, every equipment we make, conform to the standards set by some of the top agencies in the world. We also have a business person that looks at how to grow the value of the business so it can be more attractive to investors later on. We even have an art designer that looks at designing the form factor of the device. So that is not only appealing to visually, but also very comfortable to use for the patients, our final end users. The reason this is important and the reason we need to work together is because it takes an enormous amount of effort and money to see something from the concept stage to the final clinical application. In the US, on average, it takes $800 million to see a drug from the lab to the final clinical outcome. So anything we can do, such as interdisciplinary research and work that can accelerate through this process, is greatly appreciated so we can deliver safe diagnostic or treatment options more quickly to the patients and consumers. So where are we going with all of this? Well, I like what Sir Karl Popper said in 1963. He was a philosopher of science. He said that we are not students of some subject matter, but students of problems. And problems may cut across the border of many subjects or disciplines. And he couldn't be more right, and I couldn't agree with him more. We must work together in a truly interdisciplinary manner in order to confront many of the pre pressing problems we're facing today. Not only in healthcare, but also globally, such as climate change. But I'm also very helpful because I can see that it's already happening, especially with the student body at the university level. So if we can maintain this momentum, I believe the horizon that we're chasing will be bright indeed. Thank you for your attention this morning.